Well, glory. Hey, this is Dudley. So good to be back with you again this time as we study. Uh, I want to talk to you this time about something that's very important and very practical. Before I do, however, I want to mention uh, some, our featured resource. Uh, some of you have been waiting for this, uh, and for good reason. It's a good thing to wait for. The EPIC this year, this year's EPIC conference, the messages are ready. So uh, you can get those. This is Alan Wright, uh, Kenny Thacker, and, and me uh, talking about the epic of the gospel and how you interpret scripture, uh, how it comes alive. It's, uh, it really is good stuff. It, it, it's not just like good stuff. It's revolutionary type stuff. So uh, get those, uh, order them. Uh, get them in their fullness. Play them to your friends, to your uh, to your neighbors. Anybody will listen to you. Uh, a couple of other things coming up. Uh, this fall, we're having the uh, women's retreat called the Treasure Hunt Weekend, September 5, 15 through 17. Uh, these, these ladies have such a blast out there as they come and talk about what is uniquely wonderful about being a woman believer and how to embrace your own gifts and your own callings and and uh, how, how you fit into the big story. Uh, they have so much fun that, uh, you know, if you men knew how much fun they were having, you'd, you'd want to come too. I, I basically get to serve there. I take care of kids. I take out garbage. I do all that kind of stuff. But I'm watching. <laughs> They're having a lot of fun embracing the gospel and, and seeing how it relates to them. The other thing that has become a very, uh, have become a favorite is our couple's retreat. It's called a Beyond, Beyond Happiness retreat. Now, here, here's, a, here's a deal for you. The uh, private rooms have already been taken because people registered early, which you should. Uh, but... The bunkhouse is not like your normal bunkhouse. It is fabulous with the very best beds and you have the privacy you need. The, uh, the women be on one side, the men on the other. The, the, for, for all of you uh, economic minded people, it's a steal. Before August uh, 30th, for the couple, for the whole weekend, it's $275. You can't even go out to a good restaurant for that. And at this, you not only get great food, great fellowship, a lot of fun that we have together, but uh, you have a transforming experience with the, the Lord and and hopefully your spouse. So uh, Beyond Happiness coming up October 6th through 8th, uh, you need to come to that. You can stand not being with your mate at night for a couple of nights. Uh, it'll be worth it. Last year, we had quite a number of people staying in the bunkhouse. Uh, one of the reasons was because we had several couples came who were engaged but not married yet. And then some others who said, hey, you know, we, we, we've slept away from each other a night or two in our lives, and so this is worth it. So uh, don't let that keep you from being there, uh, being there, be a part of it, because it is, uh, it's important in our day that we understand as Christians what's distinctive about a Christian marriage, as opposed to all the controversy going on about marriage. Uh, it's, uh, it goes beyond our own consumer ideas of happiness into a level of fullness that you'll want to know. So there's some things coming up you, you, you want to know about. Now, this month, I want us to talk about, uh, well, the title is A Competent Disciple. I know the word disciple confuses a lot of people. We don't know what one is. We talk about it a lot. Jesus said our great commission was to go and make disciples of, of all, all peoples all over the world. Uh, and sometimes we don't even know what one is, so we don't know how to make them. Somebody said the reason General Motors can make millions of cars is because they know how to make one. If you don't know how to make one, you can't make two, obviously. And I, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, oftentimes the church and all of its auxiliaries uh, have made uh, maybe converts. Uh, we've made decisions, but we have not made uh, we've not made disciples. It's very clear from reading Paul, the Apostle Paul, 
that he was intent on the people that he led to faith in Christ, initial faith in Christ, that they get to experience the full orbed uh, encounter with Christ in salvation. He talks about salvation not as an experience where you trust Christ, now you get to go to heaven. He talks about salvation as being saved from everything that sin did to the human race and eventually to all of creation. And how in Christ you are restored. And what he calls that restored person or the person on the journey to restoration, full restoration, is the disciple. A disciple is one who is following Christ in their journey to live life at its absolute fullest, to be, to be fully human, to be the way God created us to be. And the salvation that Christ has bought and paid for for us goes way beyond just going to heaven. It is way beyond just knowing that you're saved. So thank God the insurance is paid up. It, it, it's about experiencing the fullness of why you were created. In, in fact, uh, and I'm going to use my notes this time because I want to make sure I get said to you the things that, that are so important about this. In fact, being a disciple means at least these four things. It means you have heard and responded to a call, not just to come get a ticket to go to heaven, but a call to a task. We'll talk about that task. Secondly, you're expected to prepare for that task. Thirdly, you're rewarded with more task. That is, when you are faithful in handling what you're given, God gives you more, which brings you greater fulfillment and a greater sense of who you are. And then number four, five, uh, you get to share in the honor that, it, that belongs to Christ. You as his partner, you as one who is in him, share in his glory. That, that's, a, that's, that's a disciple. That, that's what one uh, disciple is. So I want us to talk about it and we're going to use maybe uh, the best, uh, I, I a lot of scriptures in, that we could take and talk about discipleship. But this is Paul talking to Timothy. Obviously, Paul has committed himself to helping Timothy become the disciple, embrace the salvation that's his. And so we have a little uh, tidbit here in Second Timothy that gives us a lot of insight about what this competent disciple looks like. So let's read it. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecution and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord has rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God or the messenger of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So I want to pick up on that last part. This is, is quite a promise here, quite a potential that there's something that we can participate in that makes us competent for every good work. I, I, I think there's a lot of folk who don't feel very competent, therefore they don't, they don't get engaged in much. 
that, but but it's not good work like church work. It's not talking about you know going to be a missionary, you're going to be a pastor. No, it's talking about every good work of fulfilling what it means to be a human in this world, in in the world in the world of science, in the world of education, in the world of business, and you know, and whatever. Good works are are not limited to works done in an ecclesial uh, atmosphere. They're the works that humans were put on the earth to do. Adam and Eve were given the role of subduing the garden. Uh, so they were farmers and uh, agricultural experts. And, 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 and they said, well, you know, they, they weren't a pastor or they weren't on staff. Yeah, right. But they were fulfilled human beings. So, uh, so, so let's talk about this whole thing. Of what, what can you do? What can, what can I do? What can I help you do? What can you help me do? What, what can happen that would create for us or cause us to be these confident, competent uh, people who can, uh, are able to do the good works that God ordained for humans to do? Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, the, uh, let's talk first of all about the value of a model. Uh, it's interesting in here that Paul starts out by saying, uh, Timothy, you've watched my, you've listened to my teaching and the implication is you embraced it. You have seen my conduct. You've seen how I, I live on a daily basis. You've, uh, you've seen my purpose in life. You understand that I have been captivated by a, the person, Jesus Christ, that I've been called to to carry on the message that that Jesus preached and uh, provided, and you've watched me uh, be persecuted, and you've watched the Lord deliver me out of persecution. In other words, he's saying you you've seen it modeled. Now, not everybody has the privilege of watching a Paul, but we all have a privilege of watching somebody. Uh, and you also have the privilege of being the somebody that others watch. Models are important. What we see modeled has a greater impact than what we hear spoken. Not that we shouldn't speak. The, the message has to be spoken, but it needs to be modeled. We need a model for it. Uh, you know, you've seen the little exercise you play, play with tricks where people say, you know, touch your nose, touch your chin, touch your ear, touch your nose, touch your chin, touch your ear, touch your nose touch your chin, touch your ear, and people will do what you do, not what you're saying. Uh, it's a silly little exercise, but it illustrates something. Uh, once you've seen something modeled, it's very difficult to break that. For, for instance, some of us, some of you and I, grew up in a home where uh, arguments were modeled by your parents. Uh, and interestingly enough, when you get married, that's the way you'll, you'll handle your arguments. You deal with it. You're either passive or you're aggressive or you're, or you're healthy or you're unhealthy, but, but you model what your parents d did regardless of what you might have read in a book or heard. Uh, your tendency is to model stuff. And uh, a, a child who's watched their, watched their parents explode in anger usually explode in anger. Okay, so, so, so there's a value in modeling. There's a, there's a value in getting to watch someone do stuff. And you see, yeah, yeah, Dudley, and that's why I don't want to be a discipler because, I mean, I, I make so many mistakes. I don't want anybody watching my life. Well, no, Paul said to Timothy, watch me, watch me. You saw me get persecuted. You saw, you saw how, how I handled it or how God handled me in, in the middle of that. Watch me fail. You know, if you if you see me fail and me respond to the failure, then then you're learning what life's about. You're learning how the grace of God is sufficient in every situation. So it, it's okay. Uh, there, there are a lot of people who are accusing Paul of being a failure as an apostle because he got persecuted, he got run, run out of town and thrown in jail and all kind of stuff stuff happened to him. And, and so he says, Timothy, you've watched all that. And you've watched how God has delivered me, and you've 
you watched me in jail and you watched me uh, get stoned. When I was down in Lystra, you saw stone me and drag me out of the city as dead. And uh, you know, you've seen the Jews come against me in Antioch and and all these other places. So, so a, a model is really, really valuable to us. And, and Timothy had the had the uh, privilege of getting to watch Paul. Now, as I said, you don't, you probably don't have a Paul, but you have others that are around you, and you. It may not just be one person, it may be a composite. It may be different people, but you've seen a mother handle her children well and you go, wow, that's the way it's done. You've seen a father or a grandfather relate to kids and grandkids that maybe were going off the deep end or whatever. You've, you've seen them, you've seen them pray, you've seen them deal with it, you've seen them cry. And, and, you, and yet you're picking up things by watching those people who are responding in the grace of God to others, and uh, they're modeling for you the, the, the uh, Christian life, and modeling for you what uh, the modeling for you how how the gospel works in life. The three things that, that Paul uh, seems to emphasize here: he says, "You followed my teaching, my behavior, and my purpose in life." He goes on to talk about some other things, but th those are what's really important. Uh, one of the problems we have today. I think in the uh, church is that we've had the emergence of what I call the celebrity shepherd. Uh, a lot of leadership has, has led uh, church leaders to conclude that the best way you lead is the corporate model. And so we have a lot of people who are successful CEOs of a corporation, the church, their church, or, or their ministry but they're not good shepherds. See, a shepherd uh, gets involved with the sheep. Uh, there's one thing that's always true about a shepherd, regardless of what else. A shepherd leads his sheep. He doesn't just point. The shepherd doesn't say to the sheep, hey, over there is some good water. Over there is some good grass. Over there is a safe place to lie down. No, he leads them. He's with them. And if you're not leading people, then you're you're not making disciples. Uh, you, uh, it's God's way. He, he he picked the word shepherd. Jesus said, "I am the good shepherd." He was he was not really happy with the shepherds of Israel and said, uh, "You're not doing it right." So I'll shepherd my own people. So how did he do it? He sent Jesus, his son, who came and got involved with the people and and led them. So. Uh, this whole idea of being a kind of a corporate head has hurt us a great deal because so many pastors, particularly, well, it doesn't really matter the size because they've all read the same books. Uh, the, the idea is I will, you know, I'll deal with my staff or those right around me and I'll pastor them and then they go out and, you know, pastor others. And, and so many pastors, and, and I've I've been in these situations where the, the system won't even let you touch the people. I, I've been in situations where they say, okay, now you're a guest speaker and you'll speak and uh, we'll go out after the service starts and you know we'll go out there so you won't be bothered. And then you'll speak and as soon as you speak, someone will come and get you and take you back you know, to uh, pastor study or the green room, wherever you're going, uh, because we don't want you to get distracted. And there have been many times I felt frustrated. It's like, I would like to linger a little while. I would like to meet some of these people that I've just been speaking to. I'd, I'd like to know if they have questions. Was it clear? Did it get, did God speak to you in the whole thing? Uh, or, you know, just, just to be able to touch the sheep. And I'm not saying that I'm better than the, than, than the corporate leaders. I'm just saying we're, we're living in a time when the celebrity pastor uh, doesn't get involved with the sheep. He, and then we measure success. Well, he's, he's, he's a great CEO. Well, you can be a great CEO and be a terrible shepherd. Uh, so, so there needs to be a, 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 a modeling, a living it out. Paul, Paul said to Timothy, you know the ones you learn stuff from, therefore you trust it. 
it's a dangerous thing for us to accept what someone is telling us if we don't if we don't know them. Now, I'm not saying you can't have discernment and recognize truth no matter where it comes from. Yeah, but it's a lot better if you if you can know the lifestyle, know something about the person who's who's teaching you, who's leading you, who's giving you the message. Uh, Timothy knew his mother and his grandmother, and he knew Paul. And, and so therefore, when they spoke words to them, sound words to them, it was a lot easier to say, okay, I, I, I can trust that. Well, today we're being asked to believe somebody because they're a celebrity, uh, because they, they have the metrics of our world that, that they've got, you know, they, they got this large ministry, they got the large TV, they've got all this stuff. Therefore, we are supposed to listen to them because the world has put its stamp of approval of popularity on it, celebrity on the, on it. And, and that's, uh, that's not that's not the best. Uh, we we can become isolated, and and it's dangerous to be, excuse me to become isolated. Uh, <clears throat> just recently, there's been a lot in the news about the leader of North Korea. Uh, I don't I don't know how to pronounce his last name Un or Un or whatever, but uh, you know p people recognize that here's a man that the rest of the world basically has said you're dangerous you know we don't we don't want to do with you you're the word that i hear a lot is idiot you know and that it's not talking about intellectual stuff it's just talking about here's a man who's who's out of control well why well he's isolated uh, i mean yeah but by his own action but he's isolated and he's, he's around people who only will think like he thinks and agree with him because if they don't, they get killed or, or whatever. So so he doesn't have anybody around him that speaks into his life, that gives another perspective. Add to that that he lives in an honor culture where saving face is the most important thing and, and he has to honor his heritage, so he's going to honor his dad but those who thought, you know, when he gets in there, he's going to change things, don't understand. He he can't. He he is he's honor bound to honor his his dad's legacy. Therefore, he's going to carry on the same isolation craziness that's going on. And I just use him as an illustration because he's kind of obvious illustration of isolation and saving face. Uh, but I, I it scared me one day, and I thought, wow, how easy it is for ministers, pastors, leaders to do the same thing. Because if you're only hanging with those people that think like you think and uh, evaluate things the way you, you evaluate them, then you're getting a, a distorted view of reality. And if you're in ministry, you can't afford, we don't think we can afford to be real, honest, vulnerable, we're mistake prone, you know, we're not perfect people. Uh, we, we can't acknowledge that because if you do, you know, nobody's going to listen to you. So, so, so we've created our own, uh, own trap there, our own prison there. And, and it hurts in making disciples. It, 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 it hurts because for a disciple to move on in the faith, that disciple needs to be able to embrace the message of the gospel and if you're not really sure that you're hearing that message from a trustworthy person, uh, it, it puts confusion there. So uh, all of that goes under the heading of a model is good. It's, uh, we, need, we need models. And, and by the way, that's why you, you don't need to depend just on the messages on television or reading a book or whatever. You need to be a part of some group of fellow believers where everybody doesn't think exactly like you and that some of your views are challenged and you can, uh, you can embrace the different gifts and the different perspectives. So, uh, but let's get to the heart of the whole thing. The, the way a shepherd, <clears throat> excuse me, a shepherd used in this sense makes a disciple is by leading them 
to embrace the word of the great shepherd, the Lord. Uh, you don't lead by personality alone. Personality helps. But one time earlier in this letter to, to Timothy, Paul says, look, I'm in prison, but the word of God is not. See, the danger in following a personality, a person who's gifted, a person who's the leader who's seen as, you know, my disciple or my leader, my pastor, my shepherd, uh, that person can be put in jail or worse, they can be put in a grave or they can fail. They can get disqualified. That doesn't affect the word of God. Therefore, it is our role as shepherds to each other to help each other hear the voice of the shepherd. You can't be a disciple of Jesus Christ and follow him if you don't hear his voice. Now, how do you hear his voice? Well, those of you who've been listening to me for a while know that I like to use the, the three S's, the scripture, the spirit, the saints. You have the spirit inside of you that inspired the writing of scripture. Uh, you have the scripture in front of you that you are expected to read and interpret and embrace. And you have the saints around you, which can help in understanding how to interpret and how that how that works. So with those three, you have the capacity to hear the voice of the shepherd. The center of those is, is the scripture. But, but the scripture, as Paul said to Timothy, is not just about you becoming a knowledgeable person about scripture. It's that scripture is intended, was written for the purpose of leading you to the full salvation that's in Christ. That's what he said to Timothy. You are acquainted with the ancient scriptures, which lead you to faith in Christ. If the scriptures do not lead you to see Christ, embrace Christ, admire him, where he is the centrality of your thinking and of your praying and everything, then you're going at, you're going at scripture incorrectly. So, Let's just talk about, about the scripture a little bit. If God is, and I'm using that in the third, third class conditional, since God is sovereign, and since God has done everything that he does through his word, he spoke and the worlds came into existence. He spoke, gave the Ten Commandments, and Israel became a nation. He spoke through the prophets and the word of God happened. And finally, his word became flesh. He spoke finally and fully in Christ Jesus who lived out his word. The word of God, the word of God is vital. If God is sovereign and he is, and God has spoken and he has, then it's imperative that we hear what he says, because without it, we cannot sustain life. We will not succeed. Those who either are ignorant of or mishandle the word of God are guaranteeing failure in their lives, in their marriage, in their vocation, because his word created all things, and it's by his word that we walk in the order that his word created. So, so, it's, so it's no light thing to, uh, to deal with the scriptures as one of the primary ways or the primary way God has of speaking to us. The spirit who lives in us will illumine the scriptures to us and help us. The saints around us can help us uh, look at it from different perspectives and through, through the eyes of different giftings. But the center part is that God has gone, I started to say God's gone to a lot of trouble. I don't think he ever goes to trouble, but God has been diligent 
and preserving for us the scriptures, which are a record and a testimony of who he is and what he has done throughout all of history. In the scriptures, we find out the story from creation to new creation. We find out who God is, who his people are, what his purpose is, what salvation looks like, and what saved people then look like and what they can do and what's expected of them to do. We find that in the scriptures. It's all, it's all there. And, and so it is our privilege and responsibility then to, uh, to interpret the scriptures. Uh, we must hear him. There, there's no option for that. People say, well, I want to be a disciple, but you know, I'm just going to follow the Lord and, and I know the Lord. He's a living word. And, and so I follow him. And, but the scriptures are hard. They're hard. I, I don't get that. And, and it's caused lots of trouble. People argue about them and they're different denominations. And even the Christians can't agree on it. So the Bible I'll put on the shelf. I'm just going to live with the living Christ. Um, that was not the design. And that is a rebellion against God's way of leading his people. Uh, he is more obvious in leading us than a lot of us would like to think. I, I was reading uh, Romans 8 the other day, <clears throat> and Romans 8 is kind of a uh, retelling of the story of Israel and how they went, you know, went through Sinai with the law, but finally they got in the promised land, and God led them in the promised land by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud during the day. Well, those two things are pretty obvious. They are, uh, you know, at night, you can't miss a pillar of fire. And, and during the day, this cloud, this kind of glory of God was obvious. When God moved, everybody knew God moved. So it wasn't like he was hiding. It was some kind of secret code. Well, he says, when you become a child of God, when you're a son of God, the spirit of God leads us. He'll be as obvious in leading us now as he was then. It's not with a pillar of fire and cloud. It is with his spirit within us, his scriptures in front of us, and his saints around us. But again, getting back to, to, to that scripture, this, uh, this word of God that's contained in the scriptures, uh, we must interpret it properly. Now, here's what we need to understand. The big war that's going on, the cosmic war that we're, that we're involved in, it's coming against that word. Read Timothy sometimes, just take, no, not right now while I'm talking, but, but read First and Second Timothy and you'll find Paul saying to Timothy things like this, guard, guard the sound words that you've heard. It, 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 garrison it, build up walls against it, get your gun out. Guard the words, why? Because they're words coming from hellish sources that are trying to pervert, twist that. What was the big What was the big fight over in the garden? Has God said, the serpent said? There's always been a war against God's word. There's a war today. Avoid all this wrangling about things and all this stuff. Paul's talking to Timothy. Avoid it. Uh, guard, fight for, remember. So, so there, there is a battle going on and if you just kind of passively sit by and go, well, I'm going to be a disciple and listen to my preacher, listen to two or three guys on television, and you know, I'll read a book every once in a while, and, and you know, I'll, 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 I'll make it. Uh, that's being lazy. That's being passive. It's, it's not doing what Paul said to Timothy. He makes no bones about it that the scriptures are important because the scriptures are a primary means of us hearing Jesus speak to us and hearing Jesus speak is the absolute issue. You can't be a disciple if you are not following what he is saying. So there's a war going on against the word. We must be intentional in getting that word. So uh, let's, let's talk about the, the primary role of a, a discipler is to assist someone in hearing the word. Therefore, it is to assist them in interpreting the scripture uh, first. That's important. Isn't it interesting that Jesus, after his resurrection, made it a priority to meet with the disciples going down the Emmaus Road 
and explained to them the scriptures as they related to him. And as a result of it, it says their hearts burned within them because Jesus opened their minds to the scriptures. So, so Jesus thought it was important that we understand how to read the scriptures and how to see him in the scriptures. And uh, if, if Jesus thought it was important, that I think we should think it's important. Now, as we, as we approach the scriptures, let me, let me talk to you about something that I think is uh, sometimes misunderstood. We, we say that, yes, the scriptures reveal Christ, and, and so without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, we really can't get it. That's true. That's true. But there are two parts to that. There is the part of interpretation, the, the science or the skill of hermeneutics, the big word for interpreting uh, interpreting text, interpreting scripture. So uh, you, uh, hermeneutics is a skill that can be learned. Illumination, where the Holy Spirit comes and shows us Jesus in the scripture and how it applies to our life, that's a gift from God. That, that's his mercy. It takes both though. Why should we be lazy in our interpretation? Because that's something we can do. And the truth is, all of us follow hermeneutic hermeneutical principles all the time. Every time you read a novel, every time you read the newspaper, for instance, you read the front page differently than you read the op-ed page, differently than you read the comics, differently than you read the political cartoons, differently than you read the want ads, the sports page. Uh, you read them all according to the genre that they're written in, and you read them in context. You don't get all upset over in the sports page because the Tigers uh, beat up uh, the, on the Red Sox. You, you don't go into a panic about somebody getting torn up by the Tigers. You know, it's, it's sports stuff. So <clears throat> we are always using some of those principles if, if you read it all, if you deal with text. And so what I'm talking about is we need to help each other know the skill of hermeneutics, which means we need to know how to interpret the Bible in its big narrative from creation to recreation, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21, 22, uh, how that big story works. And then we need to know the different kind of literatures that, that are contained in the scripture so we can, we can interpret them properly so that we can say, this is what God said at this particular time in history to these particular people. We can know that on the basis of interpreting skills. Now, the Holy Spirit comes along and takes that and begins to show us how Jesus is a fulfillment and, and how all of those texts relate to Jesus so that we can, because we know Christ, apply that to our lives and we can enjoy the inheritance and the full salvation that Jesus has bought. But too many people, I think, just take the scripture and they sit down and go, I just read the scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to, to speak to me. Well, because he loves us and he's gracious, he will come to whatever level it takes to communicate with us. But that is not a very uh, diligent way of interpreting scriptures. And Paul said to Timothy, another thing he said to Timothy was, do your best to present yourself a, an approved workman rightly, handling the word of truth. We, that's our responsibility, our privilege and responsibility. We need to do our best to rightly handle the word of truth. When we wrongly handle it, we are not hearing the voice of God. Therefore, we're not empowered by the, the grace of God and we're leading people astray. And then we become a part of the destructive part rather than, than the fulfillment part. So, uh, it is important as disciples that we, that we focus on the word and the word inscripturated, the word as illuminated by the spirit, the word as, uh, as it comes through the saints around us. And as we are, are submitted to that word, then we are submitted to God. But do, do, you, do you understand? Do we understand? that if you're not submitted to what God says, then you're not submitted to who God is because he expresses who he is through what he says. So it, it should be a great motivation to say, I wanna know what God says because I, I am accountable to hear what he says and to follow what he says. 
So, uh, what, what does a fully equipped disciple do? Uh, I, I think it's important for us to see the big picture here. Paul, Paul says, all scripture, well, first of all, he says to Timothy, you've been acquainted with the ancient scriptures. They give you the wisdom to come to Christ by faith. That's the purpose of scripture, for you to encounter the living Christ. Therefore, we all ought to always be looking for Jesus in the scriptures. It, it, then he talks about all scriptures inspired by God's God breathed. It is profitable for instruction, for correction, reproof, and, and training in righteousness. That in the end, the messenger of God, that's you and me, all of us, that we would be fully equipped, competent in every good work. That is, we're competent in doing what God has assigned us to do. Doesn't mean we're all going to be church leaders. We've already said that. It means that we will be fully human doing what humans were put on the earth to do. What were they put on the earth to do? To worship God and rule with him over creation. So, so what's a fully equipped disciple look like? It's somebody who is aggressively subduing the garden where they're walking as they are worshiping God as the creator and redeemer and as they are, uh, and they're ruling by the truth of the word of God in their lives. As they live out their own lives, they are, oh, in one sense you could say they are colonizing. I know that's a negative uh, term in, in our culture, but that, that's what we're doing. We are new creations, new creatures, in God's inaugurated new creation, started when Jesus came out of the tomb. He's the first, first of that new race. And we are his people, therefore we are the first fruits of this new creation. We are to invade, engage, and colonize the old creation that has not yet been redeemed with the truth of the launched kingdom of God. And it, 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 once we get a hold of that, it becomes captivating. We become passionate about it. Zeal comes, uh, comes out of us because this is something bigger than we could have ever called ourselves. It's bigger than we can discover about our destiny. Uh, this is something that comes from God, that he has called us to be his partners, his ambassadors, his representatives in this world. And we, like Paul, are, are no longer controlled by or motivated by the metrics of this world. Remember what Paul said in Philippians? He says, uh, my reputation doesn't matter. My achievements don't, don't, don't matter. Uh, my righteousness doesn't matter. My status as a, as, a, as a Pharisee doesn't matter. As a Jew, I was born of the right family. That, that doesn't matter. All of these, he said, I consider as manure compared to this privilege to know Christ, his, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, and being conformed to him. In other words, to become partners with Christ in sharing this life has so consumed Paul that he says, nothing else matters. That is, that's a picture of true salvation. Remember earlier I said to Paul's concept of salvation was not making a decision for Christ and then going to heaven. His definition of salvation is you are saved back to, restored back to what God created man to be in the first place. And that is to be a worshiper of him and to rule as his partner on the earth. And so we rule by being messengers of his launched kingdom that's proclaiming a message that God has invaded history with his kingdom and you can experience it now and you can be a part of it spreading throughout the whole earth. And then one day when he returns, we get to share in his honor. We have been his people that he's used and the honor that Jesus has, we glory in. We glory in that honor. So. So that's what, a, that's what a true disciple is. That's what an equipped disciple uh, looks like. So our part in the whole thing is to, to, uh, to be good 
to be a good partner, to be a good workman, to be an approved workman handling the word of truth, to, to make sure we are hearing the word of God and obeying it, living by it. We're living it out. And as we do that, then the, the, the word of God is able to, as James says, save our souls. It's able to, to transform us and we get to enjoy all that God intended us to be. So, so here, here is Paul's uh, description of, definition of, example of what it means to be a disciple. Yes, uh, a, a model is good. It's good to have somebody that you're watching to do it. Uh, you can look around and find those, whether it's one person or a composite of others. And yes, it, the, the most important thing is that we, that we hear the word of God. So we must interpret the scriptures. We must submit to the community of, of people around us. And we must listen to the voice of the spirit. Now, I may have already said this uh, to you, but if I haven't, uh, here it is. And if I have, it's worth saying again. If you want the voice of the Spirit to get louder in your spiritual ear, become better at interpreting the Scriptures themselves because the Holy Spirit is taking the truth of Scripture and is, resound, or, or, or is resonating that in our hearts. And so the voice of the Spirit inside of us gets louder the more we're familiar with the proper understanding of the Scriptures. So. If you uh, need further help in, in interpreting scripture, there are lots of helps out there. We have some stuff that uh, I've worked on in the past to help people get started in, uh, in interpreting the scriptures. It is not, it is a skill, but it is not impossible for us to do. We just need to understand what the whole scripture is about and then interpret it in light of it. Uh, next time, maybe we'll talk about uh, some more aspects of how do we move from interpretation and application in, into lifestyle. But uh, my prayer for you is that you will become a disciple and a discipler. So I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you for your instructions in the scripture. We take you seriously when you say all scripture is inspired by God. It is profitable. Yes, it is. And so today, as we have looked at this uh, text where Paul was talking to Timothy, we want to grasp what Paul was saying and what you were saying through Paul to him and then to us. And so uh, we, we today commit ourselves to be hearers of the word and doers of what we hear. And so we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I look forward to being with you next time. This is Dudley Hall with Kerygma Ventures, and we'll meet again next month.